You're listening to the Fitness Matters Podcast with Paula B, and this is episode number 50, Getting Older. Well, hello, hello, my friends. How are you today, you guys? I am so excited about today's episode of the Fitness Matters Podcast, where, as you know, every week we talk about the fitness matters that matter to you. This one matters to me. Actually, they all matter to me, but this one really matters to me, and I have to tell you something. I really, really, really regret taking apparently one week off at the wrong time. It would have been so perfect if today's episode was episode number 51, because tomorrow, and the reason we are talking about getting older at all, tomorrow is my 51st birthday, if you are listening to this like the day it comes out. If you're listening to this on Sunday, when it comes out, tomorrow, Monday, November 9th, is my 51st birthday. And that is why this topic has been on my mind. Actually, this topic has been on my mind kind of for a while. I made, oh my gosh, I made an episode of what used to be the Let's Run podcast so long ago, and I really should have looked this up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a link in the description of the show notes. I haven't watched it in a long time. I, I honestly don't even know what I talked about. <laughs> I made an episode about exercise and aging, and I remember that I accidentally started crying <laughs> I was filming the episode because I was feeling a little distraught, a little tender about the topic of getting older and my body changing and things being different. And to be fair, if I remember correctly, this was sometime in, I don't know if it was like early 2018. I know it was 2018. I feel, I feel really confident that it was sometime in 2018. And honestly, I'm going to say the entire year of 2018. My emotions were just right on the surface all the time. I was very tender. That was the first year right after my sister died. And I, everything made me cry. I mean, truly everything. Things still do. I mean, if we're going to be honest, everything still makes me cry. But I've got a little bit more ability to hang on to it now. Sometimes I say that like I don't just burst into tears frequently. <laughs> And I say that while I'm laughing. Anyways, anyways, I'm going to go listen to that episode. I'm going to point it out to you too. You might find it interesting that I was talking about exercising and aging and how how there's kind of some bad news. And here's the thing. Today is not about bad news at all. Today is Today is a very circuitous episode. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Even though we are talking about getting older, I needed to come at this topic from a completely different way because the way that I am currently resolving my issues and my thoughts about getting older has everything to do with all the work that I have done with my money mindset. You guys, we're talking about money today. Woohoo! And for some of you, that might be a really nice deferral from talking about getting older. And for some of you, it might be like, ooh, I can't think of anything I'd like to talk about less. I know, that's exactly how I used to feel. I used to absolutely feel like money was just the scariest thing in the world. And that's what has helped me really kind of figure out what's going on in my brain with thinking that getting older feels like kind of the scariest thing in the world sometimes. So let's talk about money. You guys, we have talked about this at least a couple of times. If you if you are relatively new to the podcast, I'm going to tell you that the way that I came to self-help and self-improvement work was through money. That I had what can only be called a terrible money mindset where I really, 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 really struggled with making money, keeping money, having money, thinking about money, thinking anything even remotely positive about money, always wanting more money, but never having enough money, 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 money kind of stuff. And, and coming to self-improvement from that particular avenue made me realize that every, every avenue into self-help, self-development, self-discovery, however you want to think about it, all roads are the same. They really, really are. When I really started thinking and making improvements 
into my money mindset, I realized just how much of that work I had already done in other areas of my life that I had had success with that I just really never, I never thought about. I never really realized why I had been successful with love and relationships. I never realized why I had been capable of success with fitness and weight loss. I had done the work, I'm going to call it unintentionally, because I did the work, but I didn't realize I was doing the work. So when you are coming at whatever work you're coming at, I mean, I'm assuming it's fitness and or weight related just because this is the Fitness Matters podcast and we do talk about fitness and weight loss and and your body self-image and things like that. I'm assuming that that is maybe the thing that you're kind of struggling with right now and it is what we're going to talk about. But I want you to know that if you have had success in any other area of your life that you can absolutely apply this kind of work and understand how it worked in other ways for you. So let's talk about my money mindset journey, shall we? Let's go in the Wayback Machine. I've shared a couple of stories with you before about, about I'm, I'm going to call it growing up poor and having a bad money mindset. I've shared stories with you before about really specifically some of my earliest memories of money are holding out my hand for my weekly allowance and getting less than my brother and my sister and being really offended by that, really bothered by thinking that I was somehow less valuable than my brother and my sister. Some of my other earliest memories are of a parade that I have also told you about that I tried to put on, not even tried, I did. I put on a parade with some of the neighborhood kids where I was right out front as the band leader with my baton and I had organized the whole thing. I had given everybody jobs and I had printed up little little invitations to the neighborhood where I wanted to charge a penny And my parents were horrified by that and told me that I could not charge money for my parade and how that affected how I saw myself and how I saw my value in the world and what I could charge for what I do and and all kinds of things. But even beyond that, there was a lot of daily thoughts and messages that I received as a child as far as there was never enough. My mother, to this day, will tell you that we had no money when when we were young. And in fact, she will still tell you that she has no money. She will tell you that that she's never had money, that she'll never have money. I, it, it's very clear to me, <laughs> having done this work, <laughs> where my messages came from as far as there's never enough money. I remember really, really specifically thinking about never enough as a kid in a couple of different ways. I remember being very young and laying in bed and crying about something that I had asked for, that I had then received, and I don't remember exactly what the toy was. I mean, I was very young. I'm I'm thinking I was five or six. I had asked for something. I had probably begged for it, like, please, 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 please. My parents had bought it for me, and then I got it, and it wasn't quite as fun as I thought it was going to be, and I remember laying in bed crying because I felt so guilty that I had asked for this thing that I ended up not really liking and not really wanting. And I knew, I mean, the reason that I felt guilty, I knew that it had been difficult for my parents to buy this for me. I'm sure they told me that it was difficult. We don't have the money for that kind of thing, Paula, was probably exactly what they said to me. I don't remember the purchase of the gift. I just remember the guilty, guilty, guilty feeling afterwards. And I have no idea how or why Well, actually, I don't even entirely know for sure if this is true because, you know, I was so young and it's such a such a kind of a vague little moment in time memory. But I actually remember my sister comforting me and telling me, well, don't feel guilty about it. Just play with the toy. (laughs) 
which is super funny. We didn't share a room or anything, so I don't know if I like walked into her room crying and, and being upset, or if she maybe heard me and came into my room. I have no memory of that part of it, but I do remember my sister giving me the sage advice of, we'll just play with the toy. <laughs> The fact is, I I grew into adulthood with, with a lot of, I'm going to call them messy thoughts about money. Lots and lots of, of things that I had to wade through and pull apart. Really specifically today, what I'd like to talk about though is the thought that there's never enough. That it was something so pervasive in my childhood and young adulthood. I was constantly either being told, you know, here we have these bills and these things that we want to buy and this is how much money we have and it's not enough. And it wasn't necessarily like my parents didn't really share numbers with me. I have no idea how much money they made. It was it was simply the sentence, there's not enough. Oh, we'd like to take a vacation, but there's not enough money. Oh, we'd like to be able to do something extracurricular. I'm thinking really specifically of when I asked my mom if I could play tennis in high school. No, that's too expensive. We don't have enough money for that. And that that thought became so ingrained. I mean, I heard it explicitly and implicitly probably more than thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of times while growing up. It just simply became a fact in my mind. And here's the point in every podcast where I'm going to point to you to the episode of facts versus opinions. An opinion that you hear over and over and over and over takes on the patina of truth because of the repetition. Not because there's anything about that thought that is true or needs to be true, but simply because you've repeated it so many times. And I don't say this to, like, for example, blame you, or even really in the case of my parents, I don't say this to blame them. This was a thought that they had become very good at thinking. Truly, looking now through my adult lens, looking at their childhoods, both of my parents grew up with parents who probably told them constantly that there was never enough money. I don't, I don't have any blame for, for anybody in this situation, honestly, ever about any situation. What I have learned as an adult now at this point in my self-help and self-improvement journey is that it really doesn't take that much effort sometimes to have a thought become very easy to think, to have a thought become very efficient. It's literally your brain's job to think efficiently, to get better at thinking the same thing over and over and over. It's how we are capable of doing things like driving cars and riding bikes and brushing our teeth and doing the dishes and all those things that we do without thinking. That is your beautiful, glorious, amazing brain doing its job. Your brain doesn't care if there is enough money or not enough money. Your brain simply hears something, probably a couple of times, and thinks, aha, I'm going to get really efficient at this. This is a thought that we've had more than once. I'm going to stop spending so much energy thinking about this thought and simply think the thought. So for me, coming to my adulthood, it was very factual. There's never enough. I had plenty of evidence in my past. All the times that I wanted a new pair of jeans that my mom said, nope, can't afford that. There's never enough. All the times in my own life where I looked at the money I had made in the restaurant. I looked at my tips and I looked at my, my cash, my um, paycheck, and there wasn't enough to do the things that I wanted to do. By the time I paid rent and maybe went out to eat a couple of times and then probably spent a lot of it very frivolously too. Let's be honest. There's never enough only comes up when there's one more thing that you want. And that's what I had plenty of practice thinking. There's never enough. There's not enough. And I I translated that there's never enough evidence from my past into worries about the future. Oh, well, if I haven't had enough in the past, well, then next month's paycheck isn't going to go very far either. I became very efficient at thinking there will never be enough in addition to simply there's not enough right now. Worrying 
about the future is actually going to be a, a whole podcast in itself, but it is part of this thing that we do when, when we have a lot of what looks like evidence from our past supporting the kind of thought that keeps us stuck in, and here's this word that I didn't understand until I came at money mindset work, it keeps us stuck in scarcity. Now, I know you've heard that word. You probably, I mean, I don't think I've used it in this podcast, but you probably have at least some exposure to a scarcity mindset. When I first came at this stuff, I had never heard of that before. And if this is your very first time, I'm going to tell you, this thought is going to change your world. Thinking about something as being scarce, never enough, is a really problematic thought because it feels so truthful, so real, so practiced, so efficient. We assume that if there's never been enough in the past, there will never be enough in the future. Thinking about not enough is a scarcity mindset that is I'm going to say it's literally the worst thing that you can do if you're trying to improve yourself. And that sounds so terrible. And again, I want to be super, super clear that I am not coming at any of this in like a judgmental way. We think the things that we think, and it doesn't mean really anything about us as human beings. It means that we have become efficient at these thoughts. Sometimes we add this whole other layer of judgment, like sometimes when I first came to this scarcity mindset and thinking about things in an abundant mindset rather than a scarcity mindset, I really tried to layer on a level of like judgment on myself about, oh, I can't believe I've been thinking this way. It's so terrible that I would think about money in this scarcity mindset. Well, let me tell you something very clearly. Judging yourself for thinking a negative thought (laughs) does not... Two negatives might add up to a positive or don't add up to a positive, but two negatives multiplied do make a positive in math, but they don't when it comes to your mindset. Negative thoughts plus negative thoughts equals more negativity. Don't spend them... Don't spend any energy on judging yourself if you have had any kind of a scarcity mindset. It comes very naturally to... I'm going to say all of us. Some people definitely have more of like a positive spin or a positive mindset. Some people are definitely born more positive thinking. But again, this is something that your brain does really automatically, really biologically, the upper part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex, evolved to look for and then solve problems. Problems! Not just like, oh, hey, I'm finding these things really curious and interesting, but no, this is a problem over here, and this is how we're going to solve it. This is a problem over here, and this is how we're going to solve it. Your upper brain is actually kind of a negative Nelly. It's a worry wart. It's always looking for problems. And then, of course, it's going to solve them for you, but, but sometimes the solving part comes from the really efficient thinking of there's never enough. Well, if there's never enough, then here's how I'm going to solve that problem. I'm going to continue to think that there's never enough. So about 20 years ago, I had this this incident happen. It's not really an incident. That sounds like a funny thing to say. But my mom, who as I've already mentioned, has a scarcity mindset, who has has always had the message of there's never enough, asked me to help her with her taxes. And this was like, like literally way, way, way back in the day. Like computers weren't in everybody's homes. My mom did not have a computer. TurboTax was relatively new. She asked me to help her with her taxes. And I was like, oh yeah, of course. And at the time, I had two very young children. Both of my kids were still in diapers. I had a dog at home. We were a single income family. My husband was working at a job that quite frankly did not value him in any manner, but either monetarily or in any other way. And we were, I mean, there was not enough. Let's just say that as though it's a fact. There was, there was always enough. We always paid our rent and our mortgage. We always had food on the table. We were able to save money. There was technically speaking enough, but on the daily, I felt like there was never enough. 
So my mom asks me to help her with her taxes. And my mom at this point, you know, her, her children are, are grown and gone out of the household. She's working full time and, and she's got plenty of responsibilities as far as like helping take care of her parents and things like that. But, but she was a single income household with a single person in it. <laughs> so, so her money was only being spent on her own needs, whereas the money for our family was being split. I call it five ways because that dog, that dog had a lot of medical bills. Anyways, and I remember doing her taxes and finding out that my mom was making more money than us. So she only had to worry about herself with her money and was telling me constantly, oh, there's just never enough. There's never enough. I never have enough money. I can't do anything I want to do. Can't do the things that I want to pay for. Can't, I, there's just not enough money. And to find out that she was actually making more than us was very eye-opening. And at the time, at the time, the way I took it was that there would never be enough. That if even what she was making wasn't enough, then there would never be enough. I actually took that incident as proof of the never enoughness of money. And I, I realized that later that I could think about that incident any way I wanted to. Later, as I came to it, it was like, oh, this is simply a thought that my mother is having about not enoughness. That somebody else in that exact same position could have a different thought. In my mind, because my mom was making more than us, she had so much money. Like, oh my gosh, that must feel so expansive and amazing to have that much money. But for her, it was never enough. That was the first little nugget that I kind of, kind of understood on some level about the difference between facts and opinions. But again, at the time, I kind of tucked it away and, and didn't, didn't hear it for what it was. I, it opened my mind later though. Like that was one of the very, very first revelations I had when I started working on my money mindset. I had that memory and I was like, oh, you can think about money in different ways. You can always think that there's never enough or, and here's where we're going with an abundant mindset, you can think there's always enough. When I first started working on my money mindset, one of the things that I did, and this was kind of unintentionally, this wasn't something that I learned at the time, but it's something that I have been teaching you because I have learned more recently how, just how, how important it is to put this into practice. I started asking myself questions. When you ask yourself questions, and we've covered this a couple of times on this podcast, when you ask yourself questions, your brain is compelled to answer. That part of your brain that both looks for and then solves problems loves to answer questions, like loves it. That is, that is what it evolved for, is to you know, find a problem and then ask itself a its series of questions to solve the problem. So when you simply come to it with a question, your brain will look for evidence that supports your hypothesis. So when you ask yourself a question like, how come I'm always so poor? Your brain will come up with all the reasons why you're so poor. Your brain will come up with you overspend or you don't make enough money or, you know, you, you're always wasting it on this, that, or the other, on, on toys you're not going to play with, <laughs> etc. But when you ask yourself a much better quality question of what if there is enough, your brain will go to work in a different way. And it's very interesting, especially in this really specific scenario, to hear how very different your answers will be. When you ask yourself, why am I so poor? Your brain will find evidence for why you're so poor. But if you ask yourself, what if there is enough? Your brain is going to take some time, especially if this is the first time you've had this thought. Your brain will go looking for evidence that there is enough. Well, you know what? I have always paid my bills. I mean, I do have some debt. I have some credit card debt because of that, but I've always been able to pay off my rent. I've always been able to put some food on the table. I've always been able to do, 
you know, not everything that I wanted to do, but the things that were really important to me, if it was a big priority, I've been able to do that. I've been able to scrape something together. Ask yourself a better question. And really, if there's, this is all you, if this is all you listen to, and if this is all you take away from this podcast, here is my advice for the day. Ask yourself a better question. When I started asking myself, what if there's always been enough? I had all kinds of answers just waiting for me. It was actually really astounding. I remember the first time I asked myself this question and my brain came back with like a full page of answers, because I was journaling at the time, a full page of answers as to why there has indeed always been enough. No, I did not have a closet full of guest jeans, but I did have that one pair. No, I was not able to buy everything I've ever wanted, but I've been able to buy a couple of special things. No, I've not been able to save a million dollars, but I've been able to save some money for a rainy day. There was always enough. And having that new thought and then learning how to practice that new thought very slowly, very incrementally changed my ability to think about what was enough money. And the other thing, I mean, we kind of talked about this last week with how to, how to get underneath a really stubborn old thought that is just a thought and not a fact. One of the things that I did actually when I was, when I was thinking about this really specific episode of the podcast, I googled how much money is there in the world because I wanted to give you some actual numbers. At the time, what I did was I made a budget for myself. What I did was I made a budget. Here's how much money I need to spend every single month on my business, for example. Example. And here's how much I, generally speaking, make every single month. And I could see that I was not making a ton of money, but I was making enough to pay all my bills. When I came at it with some logic and some actual numbers, it felt very different from simply thinking the thought, there's never enough. But anyways, today when I was, when I was researching for this episode, I was, I was wondering, I was actually wondering how much money is there in the world? Oh my gosh, this, by the way, this is such a fascinating rabbit hole. Go Google this if you want to like spend way too much time on the internet. There were some really fascinating articles about how to even count how much money there is in the world because it's not, you know, it's not super straightforward. It's not like everybody uses the same kind. It's not like it's all in the same manner, like, you know, there's cryptocurrency and there's actual cash and money. And then there's, you know, metals and other things of value. And then there's property and all this kind of stuff. Anyways, the number, the, the number that I chose is what they call broad money meaning that it's not just like paper and metal, but it, it includes a little bit more of like stocks and bonds and property and, and a little bit, a little bit broader definition than specifically just paper and metal. So in the world today, there is approximately, and again, it depends on how you count it. There is approximately 90 trillion U.S. dollars, meaning that if it were all converted to U.S. dollars, because that's how I would understand it, because other money has no meaning to me, <laughs> but, but, but 90 trillion dollars. Now, and I'm certainly not advocating that this is what we do. Like there's, the, this is only an intellectual construct. This is not like, oh, this is what I think we should do with the world's money because that would be a terrible idea. And it would actually bring the economy, like the world's economy to a complete screeching standstill. But if you were to take that money and divide it by the number of people currently in the world, you know, obviously this is a more or less situation, but if you were to divide it by the 7.8 billion people on earth right now, every single human being alive would have $11,000, $11,538 was the math that I did. And I say I did the math, <laughs> you guys. I don't even have a mental construct for what a trillion is. I typed into my Google search bar, what is 90 trillion, T-R-I-L-L-I-O-N, dollars divided by 7.8 billion, B-I-L-L-I-O-N, <laughs> to come up with that number because I didn't know how to put it in a calculator. <laughs> and you guys, I totally understand 
understand that $11,000 might not sound like, oh, that's a ton of money for every person. But when you think about it, that the fact that that means every single human being currently alive. I mean, babies don't really have a need for $11,000. They don't need to get their hands on any cash right now. They're really just concerned with, you know, eating, sleeping, and pooping. Like, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money for every single human being alive right now on the planet. That's enough. That's enough. And I mean, I, again, I'm not an economist and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to explain the world's economy to anybody, let alone myself, but more money is created all the time. I mean, in one way or another through literally building new properties or printing new money, like money isn't, it's not finite and it's not fixed and it's, it's enough. And when I started thinking about it that way, I was able to remind myself rather frequently with both facts and by practicing new thoughts that there's always been enough. There will always be enough. And here's how, finally, after all this time, this is related to getting older. I've been thinking for a while now, like, in subtle ways, in very subtle ways, I've been thinking for a while that getting older must be bad, that it just must be, that you get older and you can't do the things that you used to do and your fitness deteriorates and you get sick and eventually you die and, and there's just nothing good about this, right? And for the life of me, I couldn't seem to manage coming at it from any other angle, that that I was basically thinking to myself that I was just going to hold on with a white knuckle grip until I couldn't do the things that I wanted to do anymore and that I didn't know what I was going to do when I got to that point. And here's the thing that's been very interesting the last couple of years is I'm at that point. I'm at the point where some things are harder than they used to be. Some things are different than they used to be. And I've been at that point really specifically over the past almost a year now. I discovered for myself about a year ago that, that I can't do all the things that I used to do, that I was still training the way that I used to train and my body wasn't reacting the way that it always used to react. And I continued pushing against it. I mean, I've told you guys numerous times in, in various videos and Q and A's and things that I have struggled with the concept of moderation, even though I tell you all the time that moderation is the way to go, that I have struggled with it personally, myself, that thinking about slowing down felt very difficult to me. Now, because I've spent this entire time talking about scarcity mindset, I know that you already have figured out where I'm going to go with this, but I'm going to tell you that even though I had done all this work on my money mindset, none of it made sense for me in terms of getting older and my fitness mindset until it did. And it's why I am, I am crossing this bridge for you. I am literally drawing a line from point A to point B so that you can see somewhere else in your life that you have overcome, whether you realized it or not, whether you had to work hard for it or not, you have some success in some arena where you have personally overcome scarcity mindset. Even if you never even really had a scarcity mindset about it, you have been able to think abundantly about something. When you think abundantly at something, it's that thought of, of course there's enough. Of course this is all going to work out. Of course this will be fine. There is some arena of your life that you might think that so automatically that again, it feels like a fact. <laughs> and weirdly, it's not a fact. It is simply an opinion, but it's a really, really good opinion. So don't change it. It's a really, really good opinion that is totally serving you. That is what you will need to tap into, that abundance mindset. And here's when I realized this. This was incredibly recently. I was journaling about, I was having a particularly rough day. Like, I had, 
I, I have to imagine that it, I don't know exactly what day it was. I, I think that I had just run a virtual race and I had really put in a lot of effort. And the day after that virtual race, I realized that I had pushed myself a little bit harder than my current fitness was really capable of handling. I felt very puffy. I felt very tired. I felt very... I'm going to use the word bloated, but it's such a funny word. It's very different kind of bloating when I have done too much. It's a very specific kind of inflammation that that I recognize now and that I have been working with like, okay, let's recognize this and let's make sure that we take recovery days and let's really think about how I want to, how I want to move forward. And, and, and so I was journaling about this feeling about how I was feeling very down about my current fitness and my current situation with getting older. And I started off with the sentence, I can't run like I used to. And I was gonna, I was gonna kind of do some thought work on that. And I realized that I had so many other thoughts behind that, that I went ahead and just let them all flow out. So, so here is, here is the mess that came out of my brain that day when I was feeling particularly low about my fitness and in the current state of of getting older and changing what I'm doing. I can't do it all. I'm going to have to choose or give something up. I feel tired all the time. I have to balance work and running differently than I used to, and I don't like it. Everything used to be easier. Running and filming is hard now. I'm never going to be fast again. I'm never going to run another marathon. I'm never going to run another ultra. I'm a has-been. Running isn't good for me the way it used to be. Running doesn't feel good anymore. I don't recover like I used to. I can't do as much as I used to. I don't feel strong anymore. I feel fat. I'm stressing myself out. I'm always stiff and sore. I have too much tension. I'm doing too much, but I still want to do more. I wish I could still do all the things I used to do. I hate that my body is getting older. I hate that my body is changing. And I know that that might be kind of surprising for you. I mean, my message is all about positivity and love your body and blah, blah, blah. And I want you to understand that when you have thoughts, you are not your thoughts. Sometimes, I still have thoughts about hating my body. I still have thoughts about I feel fat. I mean, you heard, you heard all the things that I was thinking. These thoughts don't define me any more than my money thoughts used to define me. They create the reality that I feel like I'm living in, but they don't have to be a truth. And that's why That's why for me, it's really helpful to get them on paper. When I saw that on paper, it was like, oh my gosh, why in the world would I tell myself I hate my body? (laughs) Like, like what in the world would that be about? And that's actually where I really started with the work. As soon as those words came out of my pen and I realized what I was writing, I was like, that is not a thought that is going to serve me in any manner. And I know that that's not a thought that's going to serve me. So what is it about this thought that feels truthful? And how can I approach this in a different way? And as soon as I started thinking and being curious about, well, that's an interesting thought. And I wonder if there's something else I can think. I wonder if if there's something about these thoughts that can actually serve me? And my answer was, I'm going to say twofold, but I think it was even more than that. The reason those particular thoughts really served me is because I created this entire podcast out of them. (laughs) That that writing down that I hate that my body is changing was so eye-opening for me that I was like, oh, I'm going to get to the bottom of this and I'm going to help somebody else. This is so awesome. And as soon as I had that thought, then I had this total epiphany of kaplum. These are scarcity thoughts that I'm having about time and my body. I'm thinking that my body doesn't have enough that I don't have enough time in my body, that I don't have enough energy in my body, that I don't have enough body to do the things that I want to do. And my friends, if my money mindset work has taught me anything, it is that there is always enough. It is simply a matter of finding the enoughness 
from the resource that you'd like to have. When I was talking about money, like we talked about, I did some math, I did some Googling, I thought about different situations, I realized that they were thoughts that I was having, and I realized that I could think very differently about that exact same situation. So here's my situation right now. My body is reacting differently to running than it used to. I would feel better or I'm gonna assume I would feel better. This is actually conjecture into the future. I might feel better running less and doing something else instead. And that thought led me to a whole other world. As soon as I was able to wriggle under this, everything's changing and of course change is bad and any kind of change about running must be bad. I got underneath that thought. I pried it up with a crowbar and I realized There's a huge world of abundance in front of me. This body is an adventure. This body is a new frontier. I can do new things with this body that reacts differently to old things. I can do anything I want. Let's be honest with that. I can do anything and I get the excitement of figuring out what I can do. I remember how exciting it was when I first learned that I could run. It was, it, it was astounding. I mean, it was life-changing. I, that's a whole other topic on its own. But learning how to run changed my life in ways that I could never have predicted. And I'm realizing right now that this part of my life, going through menopause, getting older, changing the things that I've been doing could be the same kind of life changing. I might be on the precipice of discovering something else that I love to do as much as running. Wouldn't that be amazing? That would be astounding. I mean, I've spent 15 years loving running. I was gonna say more than my husband, but that's not entirely true. As much as my husband, as much as my kids, as much as anything else in my life. Imagine if there's something else in front of me that's as good or better Isn't that amazing? When you, when you realize just how scarcely you've been thinking about your resources, you will be astounded at discovering how much abundance there is. There's more than enough ahead of you. And I say that no matter how much time you have ahead of you. I say that no matter what you have ahead of you, there is some new adventure waiting for you. None of us knows how much time we have. Rather than thinking, I don't have much time left, I don't have the things that I used to have, why not think about what you do have When you think about what you do have, it's exciting, it's thrilling, it's amazing. And that excitement and thrill and amazement can carry you to new places that fear and doubt and worry will never take you. Now here's the thing. This was relatively simple for me to have this epiphany and be like, oh my gosh, I I have a whole new way of thinking about this, this stuff. I've been practicing mindset work for a while. If you have not been consciously working on mindset work for a while, this might be the first one that you come to. This might be the thing that moves you forward and has you really thinking and practicing. And I will tell you, here are my practical steps. Number one, hear all the things that you are telling yourself right now. Hear them as thoughts and not facts. Step number two, really decide for yourself whether or not those thoughts are serving you or not serving you. For some of us, it's really obvious that, I mean, scarcity thoughts don't serve us. But some of your thoughts might be serving you. Some of your thoughts might be okay to hang on to for right now. Find thoughts that you are willing to change and decide on something really believable that you can practice thinking instead. For example, right now, 
right now when I wake up a little bit stiff and sore or when I wake up a little bit puffy and I think, oh man, I did too much yesterday. Here's my new thought. Because I, as soon as I, as soon as I realized that, that starting something new is actually just an adventure, I have been telling myself, I'm an adventurer. I'm an adventurer. I am on an exciting menopausal adventure where I get to discover new things. I get to pay attention in ways that I've never paid attention before. I get to do whatever I want to do in the future as an adventure. Practicing that thought has changed everything for me. I mean, this was, I'm going to say that this was just within the past couple of weeks that I had this, this like epiphany of scarcity versus abundance and really practicing my new thought. This is not to say that I do not still have those old thoughts. There are times sometimes when I roll out of bed and I'm like, oh, I feel, I feel puffy today. Oh, I can't run as far as I want to run. Oh, I can't do this, that, or the other thing. And I remind myself, this is an adventure. And I have to tell you that as soon as I even think the word adventure at all, it puts a huge smile on my face. It changes everything in my brain from dread to excitement. This is the magic of abundance thinking. When you realize that there is enough ahead of you, it opens up everything. It opens up everything you didn't even realize you were closing down. You think, not you, I, I was thinking thoughts that were closing down my brain from being able to solve problems. I was thinking, I found evidence in my past that things used to be better. I was thinking lots of negative things that were not allowing me to see the possibilities in front of me. Scarcity thinking closes your eyes. Abundance thinking opens them. My friends, you have plenty. You have enough of whatever it is that you are worried about not having enough of. This work applies to everything. Maybe it's a fear of getting older. Maybe it's a fear of not having enough to eat when you are tracking your calories. Maybe it's a fear of not having enough money. Maybe it's a fear of not having enough time. Maybe it's a fear of not having enough love. Maybe it's a fear of not having enough, whatever, fill in the blank. You have enough. Open your eyes and look for it. And, and tell me about it. <laughs> Cause you know, I want to know you guys, thank you so much for listening. And I know, I know that you're going to wish me happy birthday and thank you for that. Just like in advance. Thank you so much for that. It's very kind of you. I'm already anticipating that it's going to be really difficult for me to keep up with all the thank yous. So I'm telling you now, whether you leave a comment or not, I know you're thinking it and thank you. That's really kind of you. And I appreciate it. I have, I have plenty of love. I have more than enough and I appreciate it so much. Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you again soon. So are you totally loving this mindset work and you really want to do it like, you know, every day in order to get your goal? Then my friend, you need to join the Get Your Goal group. It is my personal and private, very interactive coaching and accountability group where every day we talk about your mindset and we get your goal. You can learn all about it at paulabfitness.com slash get dash your dash goal. I'll see you in the goal group.